How did Waka Flocka and Gucci Mane go from being musical and personal allies to sworn enemies who feuded for years? Formerly aligned under the banner of Brick Squad, Guwap and Flocka were once as tight as they come, and their near familial bond translated to magic on a record. Over the course of their run, Gucci and Waka found a winning formula in collaborating together, with tracks like Ferrari Boys and She Be Putting It On racking up millions of views. But even though it was a proven recipe for success, it would eventually be revealed that the odds were stacked in Gucci Mane's favor, leaving Waka Flocka to be kicked to the curb and never receiving a dime from his very lucrative career. So what really happened between these two rappers? And ultimately, who came home the winner at the end of their beef? Hi, I'm Luesta. I make weekly video documentaries of things I'm into. And today, we're gonna be discussing the downfall of one of hip hop's most iconic duos. Waka Flocka and Gucci Mane. But in order to understand that, we have to go back to the origin of Waka Flocka's career and what had transpired in his life that formulated his brotherhood with Gucci Mane in the first place. Ordinarily, stories of dynamic hip hop partnerships come from two artists moving in the same social circles in their youth, or perhaps even attending the same school. But in the case of Waka Flocka's fruitful bond with East Atlanta's Gucci Mane, it was Waka's mom. Deborah Atney that aligned their paths. A mother of two sons and three adopted girls, Deborah was a driven woman and a strict disciplinarian. She moved to Georgia and got to work at the Department of Family and Children's Services. And it was here where she began to rub shoulders with artists in the music industry, such as Ludacris and Poondaddy. And then here I meet Ludacris. But at that time, Ludacris was not Ludacris. He was Chris Lover Lover. Lover. Yeah, yeah, so it was really. Chris Lover Lover and Poondaddy. This job allowed Deborah to take her family out of the ghetto streets of Jamaica, New York to the lower middle class neighborhoods of Atlanta, Georgia. However, while things were seemingly going great for Deborah and her family, tragedy struck and it would change their lives forever. I lost both of my little brothers. First little brother I lost, second to the youngest. So I was in, going to eighth grade. He got his head ran over by my next little neighbor. And he was intoxicated. Yes, he was a white man and yes, he beat the case. But did that make me hate people? Nah. It just let me know I, I'm growing up in a world where it ain't equal. And it just created a monster. In 2001, Waka Flocka lost his brother, Malik Malfers, when he was only 15 years old. To make matters worse, Waka blamed the death on himself. As he believed he was responsible for the tragedy, he had permitted Relique to sneak out of the house and spend time with a friend, even though their mother had prohibited them from leaving the house while she was at work. The tragic event sent Waka spiraling into a deep personal struggle. The trauma he endured in his neighborhood intensified his drive for change, and Waka became determined to achieve success, hoping that it would serve as a catalyst for overcoming the societal inequalities that allowed his 10-year-old brother's killer to escape without facing any consequences for what he did. Thankfully, for Waka, his mother would prove to be an unlikely aid in doing just that. While working Georgia's Department of Family and Children's Services around the year 2001, the star seemed to align for Deborah, as she was asked if she could help an upcoming rapper obtain community service once he was released from jail. Unbeknownst to her at the time, the man in question was Roderick Davis, aka Gucci Mane, who would go on to become one of the most influential figures in the history of trap music. However, at this time, Gucci was just a rapper on the come up, who was gaining local buzz for his song Icy. After noticing how much potential he had to make it big, Deborah decided not only to help him obtain community service, but also guide Guwap and become his manager, even allowing the young artist to reside in her home free of charge while they worked on making his dreams into a reality. And this is ultimately what led to the birth of Mize Entertainment, Deborah's own imprint and management company which wouldn't only play an integral role of Gucci's early career, but would also go on to guide the early careers of superstars like Nicki Minaj and French Montana. With a track record like that, it's clear that Waka's mom had an eye for talent. However, for Deborah, this decision was anything but entirely motivated by financial gain. And it had a more familial dimension to it, which filled a hole that had been present ever since the tragic loss of Relique. And I just fell in love with him. He became my fifth element because remember at that time then, I had lost my first child, mm -hmm. my first son, and he was a completion coming back in. So you managing the artist and you move with me in too? Oh yeah, you was, you was beautiful. It wasn't, <laughs> see, you wanna know something? Yeah. He put his life in my hand. Gucci soon became a staple in the Atney Malfers household. And despite the six year age gap between them, Waka and Gucci became inseparable during his stay. 
For Waka, Gucci becoming the first artist under his mother's management umbrella presented a pathway for a better life for all of them. And given his desire to make it out of the hood, this was something that he was willing to safeguard at all costs. And sure enough, Gucci Mane's music became a must add to every hip hop head's playlist around the world at this time. He released his album Trap House the same year he signed with Waka's mom, which was widely considered a huge success for an independent artist. The album even made its way into the top 20 of the Billboard hip hop charts. And he then followed this up with an album titled Hard to Kill in 2006, which also did extremely well. Debra helped Gucci secure deals to get him performing at larger venues. Gucci man was not Gucci man for my mother, his manager. She took that man from 7,500 a show to 35,000 a show. Throughout all of this, Waka stuck by Gucci's side and continued to cling on to Gucci's ever growing momentum. However, Waka Flocka may have made a major mistake being Gucci's right hand man. While Gucci was taking center stage in the rap game, Waka played the role of being a hype man, as he was seen in the background of various music videos from Gucci, such as My Kitchen in 2007. Obviously, Gucci was blowing up, and it was a no-brainer to stick by the side of someone like him, who seemingly had a bright future ahead. But the thing is, Gucci's biggest obstacle his entire career was himself, and he had a ton of problems. For one, he was frequently taking trips in and out of jail for charges stemming from robbery, murder, and assault. This would lead Waka to begin contemplating different career choices, as he knew he couldn't depend on Gucci to redeem his ticket to success. And it was here where he decided to turn what was only an interest in rapping into an actual career. Now, Waka's main intention for rapping was to simply make some extra bread. But this became a problem for two main reasons. For one, Waka said on a podcast that Gucci Mane didn't even want him to become a rapper. I remember when I was becoming a rapper, Gucci like, man, I don't like you rapping, man, you need to be a goon. What the huh? fuck? Yeah, yeah. So I was like, hell no. But in my head, I'm like, nah, nigga, I'm about to make us big. Like, right. We're not about to fall. Right. So that's all it was. It was about just picking the team up and running right. with it. And the second problem was jealousy. Waka began to hone in on his sound over the course of the next four years, while Gucci would take frequent trips back and forth to the pen, leading Waka to eventually release his first mixtape in 09. And it was here where the dynamic of their duo would change and never be the same from the time they ran the streets together. Gucci in jail the whole year when I first came out. So by the time Gucci come out, I got one record that's popping. So he get out, that nigga like, what the f Leading with that same belief that if one of them made it out of the ghetto, then they'd all be uplifted, Waka released his first mixtape, Salute Me or Shoot Me, in January of 2009. Almost immediately, Waka's bombastic sound led him to pick up traction. With the track, Oh Let's Do It, with the song becoming a hit and leading to Waka's meteoric rise once it landed at number 62 on the Billboard charts, it wasn't long before he copped a feature from Diddy and Rick Ross on the remix. Who, mind you, were in their absolute prime and peak of their popularity at the time. Crazy enough, Waka claims that this was one of the first songs he ever made. That's like the third song I ever did in my life. This song made hip hop stardom seem viable to Waka for the first time in his life, while his best friend was behind bars and away from the spotlight. But then, as it is now, the rap game was just more of a convenient cash grab than a passion project for Waka Flocka. And he has claimed multiple times that he honestly thinks he sucked at rapping. I was a whack rapper. Like, I knew I was whack, but I was real. See what I'm saying? My realness overcame my whackness. And despite not really believing that he even had skill, he, as well as Gucci Mane, revolutionized the sound of hip hop by pioneering the trap sound we all know and love today. And things were looking good after his other tapes in 2010, such as LeBron Flocka James, and other installments to the Salute Me or Shoot Me series continued to cement his profile. He then rode the wave to success and began earning millions of dollars from booking concerts and shows. Clearly, Waka had what it took to become a superstar. However, he was still heavily associated with his life in the streets at this time. His main intent with his musical career was to leave the hood, but it seemed like it only brought him closer to it. But as 2010 arrived, Flocka would experience a huge wake up call. In January of 2010, Waka Flocka was shot at an Atlanta car wash. Although he was only struck with one bullet, it managed to pierce right through his right arm, puncture his lung, and break a couple ribs before landing in his back. This caused vision and memory loss for a couple of months for Waka. And despite the fact that he claims that he nearly gave up on life at this moment, Waka's period of rehabilitation would also serve as a spiritual awakening of sorts. I thank God for that too. That was a blessing. Why? Because that weekend I was making like a quarter million. 
I was going to buy some bricks and some pounds. And that's God that stopped me. I think God was arrogant as fuck. They turned me dark all the way. And that Waka died that day too. This, of course, was an eye-opener for Waka, and was ultimately the moment he realized that focusing on making his rap career lucrative was more important than quick cash grabs on the streets. And if that wasn't enough turbulence for one year, Waka would soon find himself between a rock and a hard place, when the business relationship between Gucci and his mother turned sour. As Waka Flocka's star power continued to grow in the rap game, Gucci Mane seemed to become envious rather than grateful for his best friend while he was still locked up in Fulton County Jail at the time for a probation violation he made in 09. The first sign being that, out of nowhere, Gucci Mane just chose to fire his entire management company and dissolve his company's So Icy Entertainment whilst behind bars. Which basically makes you think Gucci Mane was looking at Waka Flocka achieving success like this through a jail cell. Supposedly, Gucci only did this because he had accepted bookings for shows in different cities and collected a lot of money, but he didn't seem to want to inform the venues about his upcoming jail time, fearing that he would lose his earnings. As a result, he kept the payments and caused legal troubles for Deborah Atney's company, Ms. A Entertainment. Despite the split, Deb claimed that there was no bad blood between her and Gucci, but it would eventually be revealed that there was a lot more to the story that they were not shedding light on. Waka told Vibe Magazine that the devil of the industry was getting into Guwap's ear and was really the main reason that caused the split between he and Debra. And after splitting with Deb's management company, Gucci would begin to release music through his own 1017 Brick Squad imprint that was tied to Warner Bros. right after being released from jail in May of 2010. Now, remember to keep this in mind because signing to Warner Bros. will cause a ton of drama for the two later in the video. Gucci Mane also chose to sign with another booking agency that was responsible for booking shows for the likes of Justin Bieber and Usher, which seemed to be a subtle flex. What's crazy is that even though the animosity was growing towards his mom and Gucci Mane, Waka Flocka remained loyal to his big homie. And he actually decided to rebel against his mother and sign with Gucci's 1017 label with Warner Bros. Music for a rock bottom price of $50,000. Say what? Now, I know what you're thinking. If Waka Flocka was popping off at this time, and even had freaking remixes with Diddy and Rick Ross and Billboard charting songs, why the hell would anyone sign for 50 racks at this point as a successful independent artist? I seriously couldn't believe it either upon researching this video, but it's hard to find the specifics to any contract in the music industry, and really goes to show how labels don't want nobody knowing what they're up to, and just how much money they're actually taking from our favorite artists. Anyways, Waka Flocka justified his decision by stating that he believed that the partnership with Gucci would provide even greater financial gains. My mother told me don't sign that contract. I never signed to my mother, I signed to Gucci. I signed for $50,000. I had a million dollars in my pocket already of doing shows. I signed for 50,000 because I thought I could God, goddamn make it. It was a crucial decision for Waka to sign the Gucci Mane, as this would be the first time he ever rebelled against his mother's guidance. Why, did, why she didn't want you to sign it? Because I, I she got a lawyer to look at it. I was being a real nigga, like, nah, this is this my nigga, this is my best room, bro. He, he got to be a boss. Like, I did that for my nigga to be a boss, and it made him a boss, bro. He surpassed the nigga he was beefing with because he did something the nigga never did was break an artist. Mm. And truth be told, did he break me? No, I did. But I did it for us to be bigger. Nonetheless, getting the industry machine behind him propelled Waka even further into the spotlight. And after signing the contract, he dropped his single called No Hands in August of 2010. And it ended up being a massive success, peaking at number 13 on the Billboard chart. And while this was a huge moment for both parties involved, Somewhere along the line, something changed. And instead of being happy for his best friend's success, Gucci Mane seemed to become envious. The same month Waka dropped his single, No Hands in 2010, he did an interview with 107.9 that dates back to August 6, 2010, where Waka Flocka mentioned that he and Gucci no longer communicate for the first time since they had met in 05, indicating the absence of any connection between them. From here, all Waka seemed to be asked about in interviews was his relationship with Gucci Mane. And despite the success of his music, it seemed to be the only thing that people really wanted to talk about. And he would usually say that there's no drama between the two and that everything was fine. They just don't speak anymore. But everyone knew there was something deeper going on, especially after the fact that Gucci Mane literally got up and walked out of an interview only moments after being asked about Waka. However, Everything seemed to fizzle out after Gucci Mane attended a listening party for Waka Flocka's debut album, Flocka Belly, where they were spotted together and Gucci Mane appeared to genuinely enjoy some of Waka's new tracks from the album. Sadly, the bond they shared at this moment 
didn't last long. And after Waka Flocka dropped his breakout album, Flocka Veli, it was clear that Gucci Mane couldn't handle seeing someone who used to be his assistant start to become one of the biggest names in the rap game. Released in October of 2010, Waka's groundbreaking debut album, Flocka Veli, peaked at number 6 on the Billboard charts, spawning more hit singles such as Grove Street Party and Heart in the Paint, all of which remain among his top viewed videos on his YouTube to this very day. Released just one month after Gucci Mane's The Appeal Project, Waka's first studio album broke the charts in a way that it took Guwap 7 records to accomplish, with 2009's The State vs. Roderick Davis marking his first time in the top 10 of the Hot 100. From the get-go, Flocka Veli resonated with the streets and critics alike. Meanwhile, as Flocka's fame continued to rise, Gucci Mane found himself in jail again in November of 2010. After violating his probation by punching a man in full view of the cops, later landing in a mental facility and being arrested on an additional two occasions for firearm offenses. But Waka moved smart and found a way to keep Gucci Mane relevant as he spent time locked away by dropping a collab album with Gucci Mane titled Ferrari Boys in August of 2011. Ferrari Boys kept Gucci's profile high over the course of a year, yielding street hits that kept the 1017 movement alive while Flocka launched his own associated imprint with Brick Squad Monopoly. In the meantime, as Waka awaited Gucci's release, his profile continued to grow and he would go on to drop a whopping six mixtapes that same year. Then, upon being released in 2012, all signs suggested that any damage to the lines of communication between Guwap and Waka had been repaired. With Gucci even stressing this point in an interview. See, see, we the label. See, me and Waka, we are the label. So y'all have y'all actually have meetings and shit and just chop it up. Every like, day. Who's going out? Which it's not a day up? that I don't, we don't talk to each other. They would also go on to create the tracks 50k and Money Pile together. But looking back, it's clear that Gucci Mane's mindset was constantly shifting during this period. At the time, he was dealing with a 10 year addiction to lean, which he used to cope with his extensive PTSD, resulting from his experiences in street life in prison. Gucci was juggling many responsibilities, and eventually, Waka Flocka would experience a significant personal setback. In 2012, things began to get weird for Waka and Gucci's relationship once again. This is because one of Waka's signees and close confidants, Slim Duncan, was killed. He was fatally shot in December of 2011 while he was preparing to shoot a music video with Gucci Mane. The killer was later revealed as Young Vito, a rapper who Gucci Mane had worked with back in 2009 on the track Hey Girl. It was later revealed that Gucci Mane had a role in his death, as he was named one of the defendants in the wrongful death lawsuit filed in Fulton County State Court. The suit filed by the father of the late rapper Slim Duncan alleged that Gucci Mane and others were responsible for Slim Duncan's death. The charges ended up being put on Young Vito only, and he is still serving his 25 year sentence for the crime. In addition to Gucci Mane, the wrongful death suit also named Warner Bros Music International and others as defendants. The suit claims that during the video shoot preparation, an altercation ensued between Duncan and Vito or someone accompanying him over candy. Duncan reportedly charged that Vito who then shot and killed Duncan. So yeah, you can imagine that things only got worse from here for Waka Flocka and Gucci Mane. Think about it, like during all of this, Waka is still putting out hit songs and is signed to Gucci's label. And Gucci is being accused of like killing Waka's best friend, basically. Well, Waka touched on this incident during an interview with the therapist. That man know what he did. Deeper than music, deeper than anything anybody could even imagine. You know what I'm saying? And when, it, when it's like that, it's personal. So I was like, let me make me a record to show you that nigga, we'll never be friends. If you cross the line, let's go go to something different. Described by Flocka as his right hand, Waka was afflicted by the idea that he had made Slim rap, causing just another lifelong wound of grief for him to carry around, but also rekindled the pain he felt when he believed he could have prevented Relique's tragic demise. Facing yet another heartache, it would appear that when it rained, it poured for Flocka. Just as he endured when he was shot, he'd soon find his career in an uproar as his relationship with Gucci was irrevocably severed. And from here, it started getting wild. Following the success of his hits like Round of Applause featuring Drake, and I don't really care with Trey songs on his 2012 album Triple F Life, Waka Flocka was solidifying his position in hip hop. Meanwhile, it was looking pretty rough for Gucci Mane. As he faced challenges trying to get his mixtapes to reach the top 30, and he struggled to secure a budget for an album from Warner Bros under the leadership of Tom Moskowitz. 
But things got real in March of 2013. Mind you, at this time, Gucci Mane was often depicted by the media as erratic. And as his drug dependencies worsened, this perception became more accurate. In just days after contemplating retiring the name Gucci Mane to Guwap, only to change his mind half an hour later, he publicly expelled Waka Flocka from his Brick Squad 1017 group. Gucci Mane took to Twitter, announcing, Waka Flocka Flames officially kicked off Brick Squad 1017. Big Guwap said, give me an offer for this disloyal ass dude. To which Waka would hilariously reply saying, Someone tell Gucci Mane to suck a dick. And shortly after, Waka claimed that he'll never work with Gucci Mane ever again. And seemed to literally have no idea why Gucci Mane decided to publicly take shots at him in the first place. Honest to God truth, I don't know cause I'm the loyalest person you could ever see. He told MTV after the tweets emerged. I took on a man's beef, risked my life, hung out the window, risked my freedom. I never backed in a corner. To my knowledge, it can't be nothing but jealousy or something because there is nothing I did disloyal. Plus, I own a percentage of Brick Squad 1017 and I own 100% of Brick Squad Monopoly. So you can't kick the boss out, it's impossible. With shots continuing to fire online, Gucci's manager attempted to do damage control by <laughs> claiming he was hacked. But as his conduct afterwards would make clear, this was no accident. Afterwards, Waka later revealed in an interview with Charlie Sloth that he hasn't been cool with Gucci since his best friend got killed in 2012, seemingly referring to Slim Duncan. Although the feud temporarily cooled down when Gucci once again found himself sentenced to three years in jail in March of 2013, and Waka declared that he wouldn't fire shots at someone who couldn't respond, and was clearly forgiving as he would utter a similar statement on Montreality just a few months later. Uh, we went two paths in, the, in our life. Ain't no beef, no animosity. It's just that me and him got, me and him see two different goals. You know what I'm saying? Like, I guess we both would be at the finish line. We just going our own routes. That's just, that's all I can say. Blocka would eventually contradict these statements after airing out Gucci at one of his shows. As things continued to intensify, Waka would look to assert his newfound commercial dominance over Gucci, furthering the argument that perhaps what was truly bothering Guwap was the apprentice threatening to become the master. In the coming months, the pair would continue to belittle one another online, with Gucci offering to sell Waka's contract for a million dollars, and Flocka suggested that Gucci was a prime example of why you should not do drugs. Waka claims that Gucci's offers to sell his contract was all bluster, as in reality, that was too lucrative for him to let go of. Man, I be trying to buy that contract. He's a liar, man. He's surviving off that money. I don't blame him. Mm -hmm, right. Them ass cap checks coming. He later claimed that his music was making Gucci Mane a whopping twenty to thirty thousand dollars a month from signing the deal back in 2010. Over time, the barbs would turn into bars. When in October of 2013, Waka dropped a Gucci Mane diss track called "Ice Cream Cone," spitting about how Gucci became jealous of his fame and fortune. A month on. Things would veer from the booth to the courtroom. When Gua filed a lawsuit against Waka and his mother, Deborah, of fraud, racketeering, theft, and breach of contract. The lawsuit made accusations against Waka's mother, Deb, alleging that she had stolen a ring and necklace from Gucci, as well as misappropriating company assets for her personal use. Furthermore, the suit suggested that she had been inflating the expenses she charged to the label, using the excess funds for her own benefit. Sheesh, this man Gucci is a menace. I mean, just imagine not only firing the person who made you who you are today, but also suing them. Insanity, bro. Yet, just as Waka was finding himself embroiled in the finer points of rap beef, he'd soon be reminded how futile all of this was when he lost yet another brother. In the midst of his public feud with Gucci, death of his best friend Slim Duncan, and of course, his ever-growing star power in the rap game, a moment that occurred in December of 2013 was ultimately what made Waka Flocka decide to forfeit his spot in the rap game. After his younger brother, Kyle Red, who was a rapper in his own right, decided to end his life. If we count Gucci Mane and Slim Duncan along with Relik, this will now be the fourth brother that Waka Flocka had lost since 2001. Once again, Flocka would be left feeling like there was more that he could have done to avert the last tragedy to rock his family. Before my little brother killed himself, I ain't pick up the phone. And I seen him call. I'm like, I'm like, let me call Kale back as soon as this shit over with. I call him back, no answer. He called you before he killed us. I, I don't know who else he called, but that's what if I done picked that call up? Like, that's when I seen like, yo, this rap shit, this rap shit. 
This was yet another wake-up call for Waka. He claimed that he was so entrenched with rap beef and industry politics that he realized he wasn't even focused on the people he really loved. After Kyle's untimely passing, Waka would never release a studio album ever again. Instead, reverting to mixtapes that made his name, dabbling in EDM as Churn Up God, and making his money from shows. Rightfully so, the label didn't like Waka Flocka taking this turn in his musical career and demanded he made more hits like No Hands or Oh Let's Do It. When I turned to this album called Friends, Fans, and Family, I wanted to do a hip hop slash EDM record. And it's like, nah, man, we want hard in the paint, Waka. Yeah. I'm like, I'm past that, bro. Waka was basically over all the crap that came with being a superstar. He would often refer to being a rapper as an annoying task, as he hated the consequences of becoming a celebrity. After facing a major setback, the conflict with Gucci seemed less important for a while. He began dabbling with a drug addiction, and everything just seemed to be going downhill for him. The only way I could get through it, I had to stay high. Okay. So I'm like, I'm gonna get high. I'm gonna pop me some pills. That, that was my, that was my therapy. He revealed that it would take him four years to get back on his feet and get sober again. And when he returned with a clear head, the full extent of Gucci Mane's betrayal became apparent, only after Waka's relatively brief period of success. This included the unfavorable deal that Waka found himself entangled in with 1017, Warner Bros, and the ongoing mishandling of his assets. Despite his runaway success at the outset of his career, Waka later reflected in interviews that when the dust settled, he realized he was clearly being robbed blind. As soon as I signed a deal, it just all hell broke loose. Like the label been lying from day one. I told him like, all right, yo, did I recoup yet? They're like, nah, you ain't recoup. I'm like, how did I not recoup? I got 400 shows a month. Like, yeah, man. Mm. Every record I got was popping. I'm like, how did I not recoup? Having signed over his rights for a tiny fee, Waka has been oddly forgiving of Gucci on this front and acknowledged that in some instances, it was both of their naive approaches to business that were at fault. Despite being willing to forgive and move on, the long-lasting consequences of that contract have greatly diminished Waka's passion for the rap industry. Even after 10 years since the contract expired, they continue to profit from the 6 to 10 million monthly viewers that he receives on YouTube, not only to mention their share of his annual streaming earnings. I ain't been assigned to Warner Brothers since fucking 2013. Wow. But these niggas got me in a slave contract of 360. This is when I was knowledgeable. Like, I never wanted to fuck with YouTube for the fact that they ran my page. I couldn't even run ads on my shit, get money on my shit, nothing, because they got it. So niggas was hindering me from growing as an artist. With Waka revealing in 2017 that Gucci sold the name Brick Squad to the label, thus robbing them of their intellectual property, Flocka has been left with only a fraction of what he should have received from his tenure in the hip hop world. Instead of becoming one of the biggest artists in the game, personal and professional circumstances meant that he's best remembered as influential. With an argument to be made that he even broke the door down for drill music with his hyper aggressive style, sold down the river by Guwap on contractual terms before being unceremonious harmoniously kicked out of his crew when he began to cast too large of a shadow over its leader, it's no surprise that Waka has devoted his time and energy in recent years into pursuits ranging from reality TV shows with his wife to cryptocurrency, farming, and speaking out on mental health awareness in order to prevent further tragedies from happening. Even as Waka made his peace with his career path, he still is yet to reconcile with his former friend and collaborator, and in all likelihood, it's looking increasingly like they never will. So how does it end? Are Gucci and Waka still mad and hate each other? We all seen the insane transformation Gucci made upon coming home from jail in 2016, which was the last time he was locked behind bar. But although Gucci's physical state improved, the same can't be said for his mentality. Over the years, Flocka's stance towards Guwap has softened. Where he once felt disrespected or wronged, Flocka now views himself and the man that he has called his brother on numerous occasions as just two ambitious individuals that were torn apart at the seams by the music industry. As a result, this meant that Waka has extended the occasional olive branch Guwap's way. In 2018, Flocka took to his Instagram story to proclaim that he left every beef that he previously had in the past, including his feud with Gucci. Despite the fact that Waka claimed that Gucci was making around $20,000 per month in royalties while he was in jail, the newly rehabilitated Guwap that we've seen post prison may have been different in a lot of ways but his stubbornness hasn't budged. As a result, this clip from a 2017 interview with Hot 97 saw Gucci touch on their strained relationship, marking it one of the last times that he even acknowledged one of the allies that helped him make his 1017 label 
into what it is today in any public fashion. No, I haven't spoken to Walker in three years. Three years? It's a long time. Not that long. Mm -hmm. That's people I ain't spoke to in 10 years. Okay, okay, okay. Is that something, is that a, is that a relationship you want to repair or, or you don't or you like to or? It's just, you know, it's just done. Mm -hmm. I wish him well. Considering that his initial goal was to avoid falling into the same traps as his father and making it out of the hood, there's a strong argument to be made that even if he had to lose his once treasured relationship with Gucci in the process, Waka fulfilled his ambitions and is now in a position to create generational wealth for his family. But when you hear the vitality that used to pour out of every syllable of his bars, it's hard not to despair about the hand he was dealt by both cruel fate and his supposed friends alike. With too much agony, heartache, and exasperation associated with the rap game for him to remain embedded in it, Waka is off to greener pastures. But what could have happened had he and Gucci remained on good terms remains one of the biggest what ifs in hip hop history. And it all teaches us a valuable lesson of why you should never sign a slave deal without getting a lawyer or someone you trust to look over it, even if it's with one of your closest friends. But if you did enjoy this video, I would really appreciate if you subscribed and tell me what you guys think I should talk about next. Also, make sure you guys check out the video on the screen and I'm out. Peace.